Well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for taking time uh, to join us tonight uh, for this webinar. My name is Janet Heishutter. I serve as the Executive Director for the Justonia Medical Research Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you tonight. Um, our topic uh, for tonight's program is dystonia is more than a movement disorder, depression and anxiety. And we know that this is a really important subject, one that the foundation has really worked um, in the last couple of years to sort of highlight. Uh, in fact, the dystonia dialogue in the summer of 2019 featured an article on dystonia and social anxiety. Um, and our speaker tonight was a contributor to that article. Um, talking about depression, anxiety, and dystonia is always important, but it feels even more so um, given the events of this past year with COVID and everything. So we're really glad you're with us tonight. Uh, I want to just give a quick shout out to our support group leaders and our online moderators. These are people who help um, those affected with dystonia every day, helping them to know that they're not alone. We know that isolation can be a real issue with dystonia. So thank you to all of our leaders for your important work. Um, I also wanna just thank Ibsen for providing some support for tonight's program. Um, and I just have a qu few quick announcements before we get started. This program is being recorded um, and will be available through the DMRF. Um, as a, an ongoing, enduring resource. So if uh, you know people who aren't able to join us tonight, they'll be able to view it later. Or if you wanna view it again, it's certainly gonna be available. All of it, everyone uh, on tonight's program will be muted except for our speakers. Um, if you have questions, please use the question function box at the bottom and we'll get to as many questions tonight as we possibly can. We received many questions in advance. So thank you all for those of you who presented questions early. Some of them were not related to this topic. So we will get um, you answers to those questions as well. We just won't deal with those questions tonight. Uh, questions that we don't get to are often used for um, topics for dystonia dialogue articles and for the development of other educational resources. So no question is, is lost on us. Uh, we'll take the questions at the end of the program and I'll moderate them with Dr. Berman. If you have any um, technical difficulties, Jody Roosevelt's email is listed here on the screen and Jody will do the best she can to help you with those. But again, know that the program's being recorded. So, so now onto our program. Um, it's really my great pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker tonight. Dr. Brian Berman is the chair of movement disorder section and the director of the Virginia Commonwealth University's Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Center. He's also a professor, professor of neurology at VCU. Dr. Berman graduated from the University of New Mexico with honors um, and a degree in physics. He then got his master's from the University of Colorado in medical physics and then decided to go to medical school and, we glad, and we're glad he did. Dr. Berman did a residency in neurology at the University of California in San Francisco. And then he did a post uh, doctoral clinical research fellowship at the National Institutes of Health working with Dr. Mark Hallett. We're really pleased that he served as a mentor for one of the, our DMRF clinical fellows back in 2017. And we're really just delighted to have him here tonight to talk to us about this really important subject. So I'll turn the program over to you, Dr. Berman. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah, it's an honor to be here and to be able to speak with everyone and such a great way to reach so many more people, although it's more fun to be together in person. This certainly is a, a nice way to get a lot of information out to a lot of people. So uh, excited to be here. And as you mentioned, so I'll be talking about uh, dystonia um, and how it's more than a movement disorder, specifically looking at depression and anxiety. So uh, I got interested first in movement disorders about 20 years ago um, when I shadowed a movement disorder neurologist early in medical school. And at that time, uh, there was there's some increasing recognition in Parkinson's disease, actually, where we realized, you know, there's these symptoms that they, patients would have, tremor, uh, slowness, trouble with their balance, uh, but really there was a lot more under the surface, uh, things that people didn't see. And we often call these non-motor symptoms. Um, and the other thing that we increasingly realized in Parkinson's is that these non-motor symptoms 
really had an impact on quality of life and sometimes were more relevant than the motor symptoms that led to the diagnosis. And so it's exciting now, uh, fast forward to today, when you Google um, terms like dystonia and iceberg, and the first thing that comes up is a iceberg um, that looks just like the one from Parkinson's and kind of has the same concept, which I'm a firm believer in that, you know, on the surface, we have these muscle contractions and postures and tremors, but that's really a small part of dystonia. And really that there's a, um, a lot more under the surface, non-motor symptoms, uh, and these can include things like um, sensory changes and pain and fatigue and sleep disturbances, um, gait disturbances, a number of things. Um, but today we're just gonna have to focus on anxiety and depression because uh, that's a big topic just in itself. So uh, to get into the objectives of the talk uh, for you all to take home, I'll just first say this is the terracotta sculpture uh, that you might find at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, and it's for the 13th century. And it's often thought that if you look at it, that some of the twisted postures in the sculptures um, you know, maybe represented that these individuals had dystonia. And I would just also note that if you look at these sculptures, nearly all of them are not smiling. And so I wonder as well, if there was some uh, potential depression or other things uh, that we will may never know, but uh, that, that was in the 13th century. So objectives include, you know, to give some uh, definitions so we can all be on the same page in terms of what we're talking about with anxiety and depression. And then we'll talk about how anxiety and depression are um, in common in dystonia um, and different types of dystonia. And then we're gonna discuss a bit about anxiety and depression, whether they might be part of dystonia, uh, a feature of the, of the disorder or in response to dystonia? Is it something that people have because they develop dystonia? And then we're gonna highlight um, the relationship as well between anxiety and depression and quality of life in uh, dystonia specifically, and then finish with a review of some treatments for anxiety and depression um, in someone with dystonia. So just to start out, uh, the definition of dystonia, uh, this comes from a international consensus in 2013 and you know, the dystonia really is the term that we use for the movement aspect here. So this is the sustained or intermittent muscle contractions, those spasms causing abnormal or repetitive postures or movements. And this definition, uh, as well as some of the extended definition is really focused on the movement aspect. And that's what we generally refer to when we're talking about dystonia uh, is this movement uh, aspects. Anxiety now is a symptom of, um, well, it's not a symptom, but I meant to say it's, it's a feeling of uh, worry or nervousness and unease. And who doesn't feel anxiety? So it, like in this cartoon, we um, have, uh, you know, height, weight, other vital signs. I mean, it's almost like our level of anxiety varies and can be measured on a, on a table just like this. And so usually this worry and nervousness is about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. That's anxiety. Um, and as we're mentioning here, there can be a whole range of it. So there can be certainly normal anxiety. And this is actually you know, a benefit to us. It helps us get what we want. It helps us to solve problems, do the right things. You know, an example, of course, right now is we're all experiencing is coronavirus or the COVID-19. So this is certainly anxiety provoking and that might induce you to do certain behaviors to help uh, less your anxiousness and worry and nervousness. On the other end of the spectrum though is when it gets to be too much when it's excessive. And this is when you might start to have an impact on your life, the way you're living. Um, and it may make you feel moralized, upset or exhausted. And so on this other end, this is when we call it a disorder. And so that general anxiety disorder is one in which you have excessive anxiety, it's difficult to control. And according to this diagnostic criteria is, is something that occurs more days than not uh, for at least six months. And it can be about a number of events or activities. Uh, and that's really what we are talking about when a general anxiety disorder. So when it's normal anxiousness and worry that has gone uh, too far. Another thing about anxiety is that it's not just this mental symptom of worry and nervousness, but there's physical symptoms that go along with it too. And these can certainly be 
you know, uh, increased muscle tension, um, which would not be helpful in dystonia, but also you know, chest pain, palpitations, shortness of breath, uh, it can cause sweating, it can cause GI upset, stomach upset, uh, nausea, diarrhea. And so a lot of physical symptoms, and this isn't too surprising as we, we know the mind and the body are um, in communication. So another particular uh, anxiety disorder is called social anxiety disorder. And this is where there's a, persist a persistent intense fear or anxiety about social situations specifically. And it, you may believe that you are being judged, embarrassed, humiliated, uh, and it can lead to sort of avoidance of these situations or you feel forced to endure them with, with fear and anxiety. And that's social anxiety disorder. And just like anxiety, um, general anxiety disorder, it can have, you know, it's, just, it's both emotional and these physical symptoms. Um, but in this case, the avoidance is, is largely uh, surrounding social situations and events and avoiding activities and interacting with others. So just like anxiety can be normal, grief, bereavement, um, and depression has a normal range as well. Um, many of you are probably familiar having seen these uh, stages of the grief cycle, which is the, called the Kubler-Ross model. And um, you know, it just describes sort of often a normal response to, to sad events. Um, and it, it leads to uh, you know, some depression and, det and detachment and feeling of overwhelm and lack of energy and helplessness. And this can be normal. Um, and then typically through, you know, reaching out to others or finding meaning or whatever it takes to help improve self-esteem that we often move towards acceptance and then return to our meaningful life. Sometimes, however, the uh, people might stay at that bottom there in depression. And if you're in a depressed mode, uh, which is defined as having a um, diminished interest or pleasure, and this lasts over two weeks, that's really when it gets labeled as a major depressive disorder. And um, just like the other anxiety um, that we described, there's a number of other symptoms that people with depression can, can have or experience. It can change your sleep, it can cause uh, personality changes, you can be real irritable, it can be thoughts of suicide. Um, there's also loss of interest in activities or just fatigue and tiredness. The appetites can change, either increase or decrease, and it can affect your cognitive functions too. So they have trouble focusing and concentrating. We often lump these two together. So when depression is more of a disorder and anxiety is a sort of a symptom, but has disorders associated with it, uh, and the reason we often talk about them together is that they're very commonly linked. Um, they're often individuals experience both of these at the same time. And they're also linked because they have some overlapping symptoms as well. Uh, so some of the things here you see in this Venn diagram where there, there's lots of uh, overlap in some of the symptoms between these two conditions. And also there's a tendency to treat these in similar ways with similar medications and approaches. Um, so they're often lumped together. And I just want to say, um, you know, the anxiety is incredibly common uh, a symptom and the anxiety disorders are very common. So the general anxiety disorder is thought to affect seven, nearly 7 million people in the US. These are pretty recent numbers. And the um, social anxiety disorder, probably 15 million people or about 5% of the US are thought to suffer from this. And uh, another 19 million, even more, experience social phobias. Um, so it's an extremely common problem. And it's also a serious problem. Uh, with depression, there's probably around 18 million uh, who experience this in the US. And um, those who experience it are, about, are very likely, about 50% of them will have a recurrence. And it's thought that depression, along with anxiety, are the number one leading cause of disability in the US. So a real serious problem. So what about anxiety and depression in dystonia? And so this is the uh, figure that came from the uh, dialogue article in 2019 that Janet mentioned. So we'll go by the, some of the examples. So the, the first uh, inherited form of dystonia, the child onset um, torsion dystonia, uh, 
we call it DOIT1, and it was found that the torsin 1A is, is the name of the gene, and the mutation in this gene causes this dystonia. Now it's, I have to move something out of my way. So this uh, disorder has a increased rate of depression, and it's been reported that those who have the mutation with dystonia have about 12% uh, have uh, diagnosed with depression. So it's elevated, it's, it's not an um, extremely high number, but it's elevated. And what's interesting too, is that uh, many people who have this mutation do not show any dystonia. So only about 30% who have this mutation develop the disorder. And even if they don't develop dystonia, they still have been found to have higher rates of depression. And this will be talked later where we're talking about, is this a feature of dysonia? Is it part of the disorder or is it in response to it? And this would suggest it's um, a feature of it. Okay, now, there we go. So the, um, in another study, uh, those who had that TOR1A mutation did not have a higher risk of anxiety. So it may be something more specific to depression as opposed to anxiety. And another type of disorder with dystonia, myoclonus dystonia, also known as DYT11. Um, it's typically uh, caused by a mutation and then something that's called the sarcoglycan epsilon uh, protein, which is this uh, little green protein here at the cell uh, surface. And this uh, mutation um, caused myoclonus dystonia it's known to be uh, associated with um, increases in general anxiety disorder, social phobia, as well as obsessive compulsive disorder. But in this disorder, different from the DYT1, those who had the gene but didn't have the symptoms of myoclonus dystonia did not have an increase in those um, disorders. Now, my other types of mutations um, appear to cause myoclonus dystonia. And so there are individuals who have it who don't have this mutation. And it was found that they had similar anxiety and depression rates um, as those who did have the mutation. So in this case, it's almost more like the manifestation of the symptoms or some downstream secondary effect in myoclonsisonia is related to the anxiety and depression in that disorder. So if we talk about now the adult onset to isolated focal dystonias, those that have tend to start by an older age and or in um, adults and affect one body part, generally at least at onset. And this, um, you know, the most common form of dystonia that we uh, deal with that are not caused by another disorder. And there's been uh, numerous studies with these kinds of conditions that, that show an increase in anxiety um, in, in patients. And in one study in 2010, 89 patients was actually seen that this mood, like depression mood and anxiety disorders were seen in, in nearly 70% of individuals. So we talk about the individual uh, types, some of the individual types of focal uh, dystonia. And uh, I'll just make a note in this uh, art is from uh, this Italian Jewish painter, Mogliana Ani, who, um, like to paint portraits, and this is of his wife, and it's, uh, it's believed that the wife uh, had cervical dystonia, and in fact here she's sort of showing the sensory trick, um, touching her chin. What's not usually known, uh, what I'm not really told with this story is that, um, so Modigliani died of uh, tuberculosis, meningitis actually, and um, she uh, committed suicide two days later and uh, has passed away at the age of 21 uh, from her grief. Perhaps um, associated with the cervical dystonia, so that's not a sad story. Um, the uh, studies out there in cervical dystonia have found that there's probably about 40% uh, experience anxiety and depression. Larger studies have shown it could be anywhere between 50 and 80% uh, affected by depression and anxiety, um, respectively. And another uh, study has shown at least looking at social phobias and that there's even like a tenfold increase in cervical dystonia. In blood flow spasm, where the disorder affects the, the eyes, 
and we get uh, the muscles around the eyes and causes these involuntary uh, spasms to close the eyes. The um, in a large study of 159 patients found that there was some somewhat higher depressive symptoms, but it was really more the anxiety that was roughly about two times as much as those. And in this case, they compared it to individuals who had what's called hemifacial spasm. So in part of the discussion later in this talk, when we look at, is this a feature of dystonia or is this a response to the symptoms? It's nice to have a control group who has some similar motor symptoms. And we do have that with blepharospasm in a group with hemifacial spasm, which is not a dystonia, but causes uh, the muscles of the face to spasm in a similar manner. Although generally it's only a one half of the face. And so at least in this case, it was seen that the dystonia causing blepharospasm led to increased um, anxiety compared to just the hemifacial spasm patients. And in another study that had a mix of cervical and blepharospasm, similarly high rates of these conditions, uh, even up to about 71% uh, over a lifetime. So spasmodic dysphonia, which is when dysphonia affects the laryngeal muscles, those that are involved in speech, we call it spasmodic dysphonia. And this is Diane Rehm, who is a public uh, radio host, an author, um, and she has uh, spasmodic dysphonia and has actually written and, and been vocal about her uh, having to deal with anxiety and depression too, I believe. Um, so she, in this disorder, there's about 42%, um, in one study there was 42% who met the criteria for um, some one of these psychiatric disorders. And then in this case, they compared it with those who had vocal cord paralysis, which these are individuals whose vocal cords stopped working. Um, so somewhat uh, providing a control group and it was 20% in that group. Um, so arguing, that, which is above the baseline expected um, for the general population, uh, but the spasmodic dysphonia was nearly twice as much. And in a small study um, of 16 patients, Again, uh, mildly elevated from background, 12 to 19% had depression and anxiety, respectively. So focal hand dystonia, so when dystonia just primarily affects the hands and often this starts with a particular tasks such as writing, which we refer to as writer's cramp or while uh, someone's playing an instrument such as musician's dystonia. Um, and here we see Leon Fleischer who a classical pianist who had um, has musician's dystonia, and he um, often was vocal about how for the longest time he was misdiagnosed as having performance anxiety, uh, and perhaps had some performance anxiety, but his symptoms were, was not that, it was dystonia. And the, these are not as common, so the studies are often small, but um, it does show that there's perhaps some mild uh, symptoms noted in maybe up to 20% or so, and also some mild uh, anxiety in these individuals. And another study, a little bit bigger with 40, nearly 40, 40 patients, uh, did find that there's about 20% depression and about 25% anxiety. So, trying to figure out what, um, if there's differences across these different types of focal dystonia. Uh, I helped lead a study in using what we call the Dystonia Coalition. And so hopefully many of you have participated in this uh, study. And this is an international multi-center study looking to understand uh, adult onset focal dystonia, uh, figure out its natural history and uh, also the genetics aspect of it. And so this was looking at um, some of these psychiatric symptoms like depression, anxiety, and social anxiety across the different types of adult onset focal dystonia. And so here we see on the left side is the uh, depression. So more depression as you go higher and uh, the five different types of uh, groups, total of 478 patients were in the study. And if you looked at uh, depression scales, we didn't really see any difference in depression across these different um, types of dystonia. But if we looked at anxiety, some differences start to appear. Uh, both the cervical and laryngeal had higher anxiety than, than um, the upper cranial, which is blepharospasm in this case. So some differences started to emerge. And similarly in the social anxiety, 
the laryngeal uh, dystonia group or the spasmodic dysphonia uh, ended up being much higher than um, the other types. And the background though on this is that uh, all of the levels are higher than we'd expect in background, but we're now just looking at the differences across the different types. So this leads us to the question about whether or not do we think this is part of dystonia or is it a response into having dystonia? And so there's been some uh, studies on this as we'll start with DYT1 dystonia, the inherited generalized dystonia caused by torsin 1A mutation. And then uh, one study found that in symptomatic and the non-symptomatic um, individuals with this mutation, there was an increased risk of, of depression as we mentioned before. And not only that, uh, those who had the mutation had an earlier age of onset in depression than those who did not have um, the mutation. And the severity of the motor symptoms in this group um, did not seem to be associated with the level of depression. So in DYT1, it appears that depression looks more like a feature of, of the dystonia rather than a response. And another um, evidence of support of that is that um, but, and often the depression and anxiety preceded the development of dystonia in 40 to 70% of these individuals. So they didn't even have dystonia. So it would be difficult to say that it was a response to it. In a study with cervical dystonia patients that came out recently, the, um, they found also that there was uh, a difference in the age of onset. And so those who at any time in their um, lives had had anxiety or depression, they were found to have an earlier age of the dystonia onset. So another uh, support of this being a potential feature of dystonia. But there's also other um, evidence that might uh, argue against that and say it's more response. So in these uh, studies, anxiety and depression were all found to improve with treatment. So with botulinum toxin and deep brain stimulation treatments, in cases, um, the mood uh, and anxiety also improved, suggesting that it might be in response to the uh, dystonia. And while there's been some studies showing correlations between anxiety and depression with severity of dystonia, there's also other studies that have not shown that. So uh, many of these studies looking at correlations um, give us unclear answers. And so we'll show you the study we did where we did some correlations and why it remains unclear. The um, in this study I mentioned earlier with the Dystonia Coalition. So we looked at the depression here on the left, again, increasing on the scale is higher depression. And at the bottom here is what we call uh, GDRS, which is a global dystonia rating scale. So the severity of dystonia. And so you're just looking at lines, but the idea is, is there a relationship between these? And the asterisk shows that there was some weak relationships in cervical dystonia, at least, uh, that uh, the severity of the stonia seemed to correlate with depression somewhat, but not real strongly. Uh, when we looked at anxiety and severity, there was also pretty minimal relationship between the dystonia severity and the anxiety, sort of suggesting that these two things were separate and that the anxiety was a feature of dystonia. And then in social anxiety, that's the only one that really stood out as actually having a significant correlation. So in laryngeal dystonia, the, the more severe that dystonia was in the spasmodic dystonia, then the higher the level of social anxiety. And the reason why these things are get complicated though is that there might be what we call mediators or, or uh, variables that uh, impact these correlations. So you're seeing something that's related, but maybe there's another something else that's contributing to that. And so when we looked at the pain level, so amount of pain people are experiencing and how that related to depression. And what we found was that there was very strong relationships between depression and pain across all of the different uh, focal dystonia types. So cervical, hand, uh, lower face, uh, in the upper face, they all uh, had a strong correlation between depression and pain. And similarly, uh, anxiety 
also correlated with pain. So the higher the pain level, the higher the anxiety. And this um, just supports what we see outside of uh, dystonia, that there's often these strong correlations between these. Um, but when we looked at social anxiety, there was um, not much uh, in the way of relationships between the social anxiety and pain, except for in the lower face and some weak ones elsewhere. But really the strong relationships are between anxiety and depression in most all of us, uh, the types, except for um, yeah, social anxiety was less, less correlated. So how could it be that dystonia um, causes these uh, anxiety and depressive symptoms and disorders? Well, it's not clear well, why, uh, we don't know for sure, but we're learning more about what causes dystonia. And we often relate it to being some sort of disruption that affects a number of uh, brain regions. And these are called the basal ganglia here that you have uh, in the, that you can see colored as well as the thalamus. So these are deep structures in the brain and they connect um, lots of other regions in the brain to each other. So they connect to cerebellum and the brain stem as well as to the motor cortex. And these are these networks that we think are important or disrupted in um, dystonia. And the thing is, is that the basal ganglia and the thalamus and all these structures, they also are connected to other things in the brain besides motor circuits, motor network. They also help uh, regulate thought and, and cognition, what we call the associative circuit here. But they also help regulate emotion and um, reward. And so these are, these brain structures that are known to, to be related to dystonia um, are also important for other aspects of our functioning. And so it's possible that whatever is disrupting it in the motor network is having an impact on these other, on the cognitive and um, emotional networks as well. The other thing is that there may be some um, disruption in how the brain cells communicate to each other. So this is just a representation of how one of the neurons or a brain cell, um, there's an electric current that passes down and then it releases uh, well, these brain chemicals that we call neurotransmitters and they just go to a receptor on a different brain cell and that it either passes on the electric current or doesn't. And so this is how brain cells communicate with each other. And there's some evidence from you know, genetic studies and others that these um, uh, various genes that are important to regulate this communication uh, could be impacted in dystonia. And those may share some similarities with um, genes that are noted to be uh, related to anxiety and depression. And similarly, these strain structures we said were all connected, they using uh, similar brain chemicals. And so uh, there could be alterations in these brain chemicals or how they're communicating in brain cells. And it would be hard to believe that it would just affect the motor system. And so that's um, you know, possible ways where it might affect other things such as uh, you know, if serotonin is important in some aspect of the communication for dystonia, uh, we can also see it having some impact in, in a, a mood as well. On the other hand, uh, it's not much in terms of response uh, to dystonia and how that might uh, lead to depression and anxiety, but this came from a 2005 study that talked about how dystonia is that part on the surface where it's visible postures, and this may lead to a sense of disfigurement, um, which could possibly uh, you know, induce a negative body concept and lower one's self-esteem, eventually leading to depression, or it could alter your, um, your it could be, feel it's perceived stigma, uh, lead to social embarrassment and avoidance and sort of um, result in social anxiety disorder. So these are just some models about how having dystonia might um, lead to some of these symptoms. But most importantly is really is the impact on quality of life. So it's in, in uh, dystonia, it's really been pretty well demonstrated that quality of life is impacted. Um, and there's a large number of studies show this. And then many also show that anxiety and depression are important 
you know, contributors to this disability and diminished quality of life, and perhaps some of the most important uh, contributors to those aspects. And this study will be coming out this year, um, which I was a part of, which comes out of the same uh, dystonia coalition data. And um, what we looked at here is these in the middle are ways that um, we, we uh, break down uh, some quality of life. This is done with uh, the RAND Corporation created this uh, scale um, called the short form 36. And it covers a number of areas that we, we um, I think are related to uh, quality of life. These could include general health, physical functioning, physical role functioning, pain, energy, fatigue, as well as emotional well-being, emotional role functioning, and social functioning. So this is one way we divide it up, um, how we might measure someone's quality of life in these different categories. And what we found in the study is if you look at the top, dystonia uh, and tremor, they had some weak um, ability to predict whether uh, there was uh, increased pain, reduced sort of uh, quality of life in these different areas. But if you look at the bottom of this figure, the depression, general anxiety, and social anxiety, each of them um, predicted the quality of life at each in, uh, of these categories and some in very strong ways. And so the, the study that essentially demonstrated what we already know is th that uh, just like in other disorders like Parkinson's, that these things are uh, some of the biggest contributors to quality of life. Uh, so now we'll jump to the last section, which is about treatment. And, um, you know, we're, I'm sure lots of anxiety is being um, reduced with the advent of the COVID-19 vaccine. And in, if we only wish that we had uh, such a focus and uh, concentrated effort to try to get some vaccine for things like dystonia, uh, or, as well as anxiety and depression, but we don't have that. So uh, we'll talk about what thoughts uh, we have on treatment. So my first you know, approach is, uh, first is, do we need to seek help? Um, so it's hard to help someone if, if they don't seek help. And it's also crucially important that if someone is feeling hopeless or having thoughts of suicide or any um, uh, thoughts of hurting themselves, that they seek help. Uh, and this comes from the Estonia Medical Research Foundation website um, with you know, the National Suicide Prevention Line and other things you can, uh, other uh, folks you can reach out to. Uh, so the first step is to make sure you seek help for this. Uh, also in our article um, from the Estonia Dialogue in the summer of 2019, um, there's, when is it time? So you say, when, when should you reach out? Um, and so, you know, if, if any of your symptoms feel overwhelming, if you can't do things that you used to do or you want to do, or you've lost interest in doing them, if your friends or your family express concern to you, if um, you feel like things are out of your control, um, or if you feel like you need help, those are signs that you should ask for help. So that's the first uh, step. And then, um, you know, whether or not um, scientifically we can prove, uh, you know, whether um, dystonia and uh, is, is a response or uh, a feature of dystonia, there's still plenty of evidence that suggests that if you treat the dystonia that you can improve quality of life. And so these are a list of studies here. Um, you can see often these are in the focal dystonias. Those are often the ones we use botulinum toxin for, uh, but also some deep brain stimulation studies. And they all show that if you treat the um, dystonia, that often uh, the mood can get uh, better and quality of life can improve. Um, there's also evidence that um, there's improvement in pain uh, with botulinum toxin injection, deep brain stimulation. So that's a, um, this is, we showed the tight correlations between pain, anxiety, and depression. Uh, pain is certainly something that, that uh, should be targeted and treated uh, in dystonia. Um, okay, and the third thing to think about is to actually target the anxiety and depression and treat them. 
And you don't need to read uh, the writing if it's too small here, but essentially what this just outlines is that it's a stepped approach and it all depends on the severity of the symptoms. So if it's mild depression or mild anxiety, you might just need to do some education, walks, you know, vacation, some self-help, uh, and that might be sufficient to sort of um, treat you. And then when it gets to be more um, mild or bothersome to moderate, you know, we start to think about medications, we start to think about uh, psychological therapies, such as CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, or other um, group interventions to try to help people feel better. And then if it's more severe, uh, certainly if it, um, it requires generally medication or some um, uh, augmentative type therapies like electroconvulsive therapy, if it's severe depression, maybe inpatient stay um, and similar with anxiety. So um, in dystonia, um, people might ask about what kind of antidepressant medications to choose. There are lots of different options out there and it's hard to go through them all. Uh, so I will just mention a couple of things. So uh, a number of the antidepressant medications out there actually are known to relieve chronic pain. And these are the classes um, called serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors or SNRIs. Uh, and the names of them here, benlafaxine, duloxetine, desmenfaxine. Um, these might be ones to think about early because if, especially if you have pain, uh, because those um, may be helpful. Uh, I would just say, but you have to be cautious with some antidepressant medications and it's not clear uh, that they uh, worsen things, but there's uh, a number of um, case reports and concerns that there may be some uh, worsening. So I just say caution. It's not a um, you know, warning or, or do not take these, but it's a caution that tricyclic antidepressants, uh, which are often also used for pain, and the SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, some people may have um, feel some worsening with those. Another thing to keep in mind um, that there's a tendency for uh, psychiatrists to use uh, dopamine antagonists or neuro, what we call neuroleptics to treat um, some cases of depression. And so these are medicines uh, like the ones listed here, uh, Abilify has commonly been used, Ipraxa. These are medicines that may be used for depression, but they block dopamine. And we know that blocking dopamine can cause uh, dystonia, um, certainly worse than it, make it more um, uh, permanent conditions. So we want to um, limit the use with those. And finally, just to um, end in the treatment section, uh, we, it's best to try to replace bad habits uh, with good habits. And so some things that may be helpful for anxiety and depression uh, include limiting alcohol, coffee, limiting your time on social media, less doom scrolling, as they say, uh, avoid oscillation, rumination, um, you know, limiting negative thinking. If these things are hard just to drop, then I recommend you try to replace these with something that's good. So good habits, you know, eating good food, teas, staying hydrated, uh, definitely increasing physical exercise and activity and getting good sleep. So all those things I think help with anxiety and depression and uh, should be incorporated as part of the treatment. And that's it, I'll just uh, spend, uh, to say, acknowledge the Estonia Medical Research Foundation for funding the fellow, as well as uh, all the great work they do for patients and the Estonia Coalition, uh, the Benign Essential Research Foundation, um, others who have helped support me uh, in my dystonia research and to all the participants out there who have volunteered to be part of these studies. It's really helpful and we're, uh, helps accelerate our uh, advances that we can make in Estonia and, and hopefully uh, improve lives. That'd be it. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Uh, you covered a lot um, in a very short period of time, um, a lot of information that we'll want to digest. So thank you very much, Dr. Berman. We have lots of questions. So um, let me just get to um, 
uh, a couple of them. So do, one um, person wants to know, do you, do you recommend a neuropsych evaluation? And what is a neuropsych evaluation? Yeah, so we generally use the term neuropsychological evaluation to do a broad range of cognitive tests and assessments uh, to sort of look at the uh, cognitive function. So this could be memory, executive function, visual, spatial, language function, uh, those aspects. Often as part of that testing, um, there can be tests for anxiety and depression included in those because it's, as we mentioned earlier, it's, it's known that depressive symptoms, for example, can affect your attention, can affect your memory and thinking. Uh, and so that's often part of that evaluation, but usually you do that evaluation when there's cognitive complaints, um, such as trouble with your memory. Okay. Um, so uh, you talked a little bit about um, uh, treating the symptoms of dystonia, which can contribute to helping people's mood and just feel better that, you know, they're not dealing with um, such uh, poor symptoms and movement kind of thing. Um, what do we know about DBS and its effect on depression? Um, does it make it better? Does it make it worse? We know it can help people's their dystonia symptoms, but what does it do to their depression? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this um, so it's a good point. I mean, there's there's two things to talk about. One is that there is a, there are investigations out there right now looking at deep brain stimulation specifically to treat major depression disorder, uh, and that those seem to be um, positive studies. And so it's interesting to, to hear specifically using that technique to treat depression. In terms of whether the treatment of DBAS with, um, when you're targeting dystonia and then whether that has effects on mood, these things are often um, included in the study but not part of the primary outcome we say, um, but there does seem to be improvements in quality of life, uh, in pain and in um, mood from these interventions. So, you know, they're not, that's not the primary uh, target when you're um, doing deep brain stimulation in dystonia, but that does seem to be helpful for that. And yeah. is it a consideration for someone if they um, have uh, generalized dystonia and they're also having depression, does that make them a, a better candidate for DBS or is it more concerning for, as a candidate for DBS? Well, there um, for the type of for where we target for dystonia, uh, there's less of a concern with uh, depression. Um, it's just the the target that for the stimulator is not one that's the one that you would use if you just had depression. Um, the is in this uh, different targets that have been explored in dystonia. There sometimes is a potential to worsen depression or um, increase uh, suicidality, the thoughts of suicide. And so in those cases, we would want to manage those symptoms and try to treat those prior to doing deep brain stimulation surgery. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about the medications. Some of them um, you know, have some side effects that are concerning, um, may make some symptoms worse. Um, which antidepressants are less likely to aggravate dystonia symptoms? So the, the one that I mentioned, the SNRIs that actually target um, both chronic pain and depression, there's not much that I have seen that that's shows that they worsen um, dystonia. Uh, so it's the, the bigger one that looks to be concerning would be the antidopaminergic ones that I mentioned that you would wanna avoid. The tricyclics have a number of times been implicated in worsening or causing dystonia in individuals. And then a, a much less uh, the SSRIs. I will still say that most, many patients that I treat are on SSRIs. So I, I found them that, that um, to be helpful and useful and not worsen dystonia. So again, remember sometimes when people have a um, you know, report to uh, you know, some adverse event to this, it's, it's often on a very small you know, risk scale still. Uh, so for dystonia, I think I generally tend to first try the SNRIs and maybe the SSRIs. Um, and there's, a, there's some other types of antidepressants I didn't cover that could be considered depending on the situation.
We, we had a number of questions about people who are being treated with the SSRIs and they feel like it's making their dystonia symptoms worse. So we should encourage them to talk with their doctor then about these alternatives, right? That they may be offering yeah, relief. And uh, I, I think so. I think, you know, we have to listen to, listen to the patients just because a study says only 5% so it doesn't mean that you're not, the, when you're in the 5% or the 95. So yeah, certainly if you, if you feel that it's major symptoms worse, there are a lot of options um, out there to treat depression. And even, even a medicine in the same class might be better tolerated. Um, so say it really helped your mood, but it didn't, um, but it, it seemed to make your dystonia worse. You might try same similar medicine in the same class and it maybe it was better tolerated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a question from a parent about um, recommendations for how to monitor and um, possibly manage depression and anxiety in young adults with DYT1 dystonia? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I have to have a caveat that I am a neurologist and, and um, don't see uh, pediatric uh, populations or, or um, so I, I don't, I would advise working with the, uh, the psychiatrist who sees children on that. And then the same principles would apply in terms of which ones to, to have caution with and which ones to avoid. I would, my, to my knowledge, there's not much difference between the treating the children and the adults in this, um, because depression is, you know, such a determinant of, of quality of life and disability, and so you want to treat them. Um, but I would defer to a probably a child psychiatrist. Right. And we, we had some um, questions about how do you get referred to a psychiatrist? You know, how do you, how do you identify a mental health provider, um, especially if your neurologist is a little resistant to that? Do you have recommendations on that? Yeah, it's always difficult navigating this. I don't, I don't know why, um, you know, I, I think, you know, we, we need to be a team approach on, so, you know, uh, it's always hard to hear that people have trouble talking to their providers about these things, uh, but you can access them various ways. So you can find out if your insurance allows you to, you know, do you have to get a referral from um, another provider or can you get a, a, your own appointment direct with somebody? I think support groups like the MRF where people can interact and try to hear about others in, in their area that are open to, to that or, you know, who, who they get treated by. Uh, I think that, um, you know, going to your primary care provider, it generally is a way uh, of getting referred to specialists. Um, if you're not getting it through the neurologist, uh, then, then try your primary care provider. Those are yeah. Some yeah, it's a great, great suggestion. Uh, oftentimes you have to get that referral in order to be, have insurance coverage, which unfortunately, you know, is an important factor in all of this. So that's a great suggestion. Um, somebody, um, wanted to know what, what you would recommend once they, um, they find a, a mental health provider who may not be aware of what dystonia is, what, what they should be, sh what, we sh what should we share with that mental health provider about dystonia? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, it would be nice to have some, you know, maybe this is something we can work on together is develop yeah. some, um, informational packets that relate to some of the psychiatric, um, you know, associations with dystonia. I mean, it, I think that, you know, it's important for them to recognize, first and foremost, that they, they won't be able to prescribe all the things that they want to, there's going to be some contraindications. And so they need to be aware of that. So I think it's important anytime someone with dystonia sees a mental health provider that they disclose this. Um, because there's there's a risk of being treated with something you shouldn't be on, so that's important. Um, I think you, you know it's sometimes there might be um, uh, we we have here at VCU we have a neuropsychiatrist. So these are individuals who, who are psychiatrists, but they uh, have some background in neurologic disease. So they so they may be more aware of some of the specific things that. Uh, an individual is dealing with. So I might put, for example, the uh, in spasmodic dysphonia, laryngeal dystonia, we found really high rates of social anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, someone who, who understands the neurologic literature or works with individuals who, who know dystonia um, can maybe use that information to target uh, treatment in a, in a 
different or customized way. Yeah, yeah, it's it's important, I think. Um, uh, we, we, we talked about the social anxiety and we had a um, question from somebody who, who said when, you know, they're in a relaxed place like at home, they're generally pretty good. But when they anticipate going outside, um, you know, to be social or to go shopping or whatever, they start to get anxious. And then they don't know sort of um, this person um, says they have cervical dystonia. So they're trying to, they're fighting their head, you know, which it sort of gets to be a vicious circle. Um, and then they get very anxious and then they just, they, they can't, they can't complete the task they, they thought they would. Do you have suggestions for how people might be able to manage those kinds of anticipatory kinds of anxiety? Yeah. So, well, I mean, other than sort of the, the four steps I brought it up today, um, you know, including treating the dystonia, because just like you say, the more dystonia starts to activate, the more the social anxiety can be triggered. Um, so treating the dystonia, um, but just coming up with some ideas. Sometimes um, if there is a, a identifiable trigger, sometimes we could do things such as um, uh, this, there's a medication, Interol, that's used for performance anxiety, for example, that just helps lessen or dampen the, the adrenaline response. Um, and so there might be ways to take some medicines just sort of as needed, just to help dampen the, the, the situation from making things worse, if that makes sense. So uh, sometimes I might try that. Um, so that'd be one way, or you know, some of the, the medications that are muscle relaxers that we use, um, that maybe we don't want to use long term, like a, what we call benzodiazepines. Um, sometimes we can use those just for helping getting through things. Um, again, that's that's sort of talking about you know triggered events. I mean, if there's social anxiety and you're not going out uh, because you're dystonia, then we need to treat this as a social anxiety disorder um, and you know seek help for that. Right. Right. Um, just one last question. Uh, are there um, natural remedies that, that uh, I mean, you talked a little bit about avoiding caffeine and, you know, those kinds of things. Are there natural remedies that might be able to help us? Yeah, that's a good, I mean, I, um, right, that there are, I have lots of people who try different things like that. And it seems to be individual, I guess, you know, as, as sort of the classically trained uh, doctor usually want to try to see some uh, controlled file or something to, to support that. But there's some there's some um, supplements out there. Um, uh, what is the one that we use for d depression? Not think below it. But the, the, there, there are some that people will try and, and some have success with that. And certain things, you know, I wonder about like kava tea and people who drink that, if it's just the, the process of making the tea mm -hmm and relaxing and sort of the, the surroundings that, that are helpful or is there something in kava tea, that type of thing. So mm -hmm. St. John's work is what I was trying to think of. Ah, uh, yeah. They have shown, you know, it seems in, in some studies, some studies that it's helpful for depression. So they could, they, I think they could be tried. I always recommend, you know, if it's not something that's gonna break the bank or interact with one of your other medications, then there's generally no harm in trying these. Um, and you know, usually for something like anxiety, depression, you have to try things for four to six weeks, you know, to to see if it's going to have some benefit. If it doesn't seem to help after that time, then drop it and move on to the next thing. Yeah, that's good. Good advice. Um, uh, and we would always recommend um, whether it's teas or whatever, any of sort of these natural remedies that that people always advise their their physicians of what they're doing because you just never know about you know, reactions between medications and stuff. So if you're thinking about trying some of these, please just make sure your doctor is aware of that. So um, Dr. Roman, this was great. Um, thank you very much. I mean, this is a really, really important subject and um, you've helped us better understand it. And it's one that we will continue um, as an organization to push for science on because it is so important. So, um, and hopefully as a society, we will talk more about mental health and its importance for everybody, you know, whether they suffer from a movement disorder like dystonia or not. So, um, and to, to everybody who, who logged in tonight, thank you very much. Your questions were fabulous. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to more of them, but as I said, we will certainly use them um, 
uh, to help us develop articles going forward. So um, thank you, everybody. H have a, um, a good evening and be well, stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Berman, again, very much. We appreciate your time and effort and all you do. Thank you. Good night, everyone.